For this talk, I'm going to be looking at the way that plants move. Uh, we're going to take a walk with weeds, a ramble with rudderals. Um, the starting point for my planty perambulations are, I know that uh, this isn't going to end there, I'm going to carry on with these uh, ridiculous alliterations. Uh, my planty perambulations begin with the multi-species approaches adopted uh, within anthropology and uh, particularly the work of, uh, of Anna Singh. And what I found really useful uh, about her work in particular is the way uh, it shows how um, ecologies, environments emerge out of the relationships between uh, different elements of the world. And, uh, which can inc include the actions of humans, but where humans uh, aren't really in charge or in control. Um, and she demonstrates this really nicely with the example of uh, Satyoma forests in Japan. Um, and she describes how these, these uh, sort of forested environments, very specific types of forest environment, are formed and maintained by a blend of human activity, which can include uh, coppicing, it can include small scale cultivation, intentional clearance of uh, areas of woodland and burning, and the clearance of organic litter from the forest floor. But along with that, you've also got the actions of different plant and animal species as uh, sort of acting on and then responding to the actions of humans. And the, the crucial point that, that she, she makes is that none of these species intentionally creates or maintains this particular environment. People are doing things intentionally, but they're not intentionally creating this, this forest. But all of these different species, humans and otherwise, are all integral to it. And this results in what Singh calls um, an unintended design. Um, now, I find uh, this approach really useful as an alternative to the way we think about uh, the human plant relationship archaeologically. Um, and here we tend to emphasize uh, like the active nature of humans in terms of processes of cultivation, harvesting, and management. Um, but also, we see sort of the planty end of that as far more passive as things that are harvested or processed what's, or whatever. I and mean, this is true not only of uh, farming communities, but also the archaeology of hunter gatherers and particularly in the Mesolithic. And that's what we're talking to in this, uh, in the, in this talk. So in the Mesolithic, we tend to see plants as, as resources. We see them as sources of food and materials that humans harvest through various strategies. And these strategies can include forms of plant management, such as coppicing or woodland clearance, um, or it can include uh, various other forms of sort of gathering strategies and sort of harvesting strategies and so forth. And we have good evidence for some of these processes in the pollen record for the British Mesolithic. Um, here's a quick example. It's from uh, North Gill on the North York Moors. And this is a great example of uh, what appears to be intentional processes of um, woodland management through clearance and uh, sort of burning. And what the pollen profiles from this site and from other sites show are they begin with uh, episodes of what appears to be ca uh, canopy manipulation. So we see uh, trees, uh, pollen of tree species declining, which means that trees are either being brought down deliberately or they're falling through natural processes. And then this is usually followed by uh, large inputs of uh, microscopic charcoal into the sediments, which reflects the, the repeated burning of the cleared area by humans. Uh, and this combination of uh, canopy opening, which increases the amount of light reaching the forest floor, and then uh, the, the, the fire, the burning of the vegetation, that encourages the growth of a whole range of different plant species within the cleared area. And we generally think that people are doing this uh, either as a, uh, as a hunting strategy in the Mesolithic uh, to attract uh, browsing animals like red deer to the area, or it's done to encourage the growth of certain uh, uh, economically important plants, so species like hazel, which is a really um, important a source of food. Uh, and in fact, both of those interpretations probably hold true. Now, um, I've previously argued, and in fact, I'd still argue that, that woodland clearances are a really good way of thinking through the relationship between humans and non-humans. They're really great arenas to explore the ways plants, humans and animals were all interacting with each other in particular environments during the Mesolithic. But these sort of scenarios do have a problem, and that's the issue of intent. Um, when we think about woodland clearance or, or any form of, of plant management, um, it's only the humans that act with intent. Plants simply respond. If we think about the example from, uh, from this one from North Gill, humans decide to burn the site, but plants don't really choose to grow over the burned areas. Uh, and that means that we're immediately seeing humans as playing uh, an active role in this relationship and plants as playing a more passive role. Um, 
and I think that if we if that's our starting point, if we come to it from from that position of human intentionality and plant unintentionality, it becomes harder to appreciate other forms of human plant relationships in the past and how these may have been perceived by people at that time. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to take intentionality out of the equation and look at relationships between humans and plants that aren't the result of deliberate management. And that's why I want to think about plant movement. Now, obviously, plants don't move. They are literally rooted to the ground. But we can think about plant movement in terms of the way that new plant communities form in, it, form in areas where previously they weren't growing. And they do this through uh, various means of uh, propagation. If we think about uh, plants that reproduce by seeds, for example, uh, the parent plant will send out seeds that are either carried by wind or water uh, or they're, they're being moved by, by animals until they're deposited on the ground. And, and if conditions where uh, the seeds find themselves are suitable, then a new plant will start to grow. And in this way, we can see plants as communities moving onto areas around them. Uh, and obviously this all works in reverse as well. Plants can also leave areas. They can move away from places where they had been growing. And this happens if conditions change in those places where plants were originally growing, the plants will die out. And then, we, as I say, we can see this as plants retreating or sort of moving away from those areas. Now, this process of plant movement is entirely dependent on relationships between plants and other elements of the world. These can be relationships uh, with other plants. So you might have a plant that's casting shade over the plant that's trying to grow. It could be competing for space with it. It can be interactions between the plant and the ground surface that the plant is rooting into, the nutrients in the soil. It could be relationships with the, the animals that might be transporting seeds or disturbing soils, weather events, climate and so on. It's a whole series of, of relationships between the plant and other aspects of the world. And it's through these relationships that plants are able to expand into sort of new areas or to retreat, recede or retreat from them. So I'd argue that uh, the mo this movement, uh, movement entangles plants in the lives of, uh, of other things in ways that aren't necessarily planned or intended. <clears throat> and this can include uh, entanglements with humans. And that's what I'd like to focus on uh, for the range of this talk. I'd like to look at how uh, humans and plants uh, were entangled in each other's lives through, through the actions of movement, how uh, the uh, how mesolithic ecologies, how environments at the time emerged from this entanglement, and how humans may have come to perceive and understand plants through their encounters and experiences of planty movement. Um, to do this, I'm going to give a brief case study uh, that's based on uh, archaeological and paleoecological studies carried out at Mesolithic sites around the Paleo Lake Flixton in the north of England. So we're back to the Mesolithic. Uh, we're dealing with uh, the very early part of the period. So we are just a few centuries after the end of the last ice age. We're around about uh, 11,300 years ago. Now, during the Mesolithic, uh, the Paleo Lake Flixton in North Yorkshire would have been a, a very large lake. It had formed several millennia earlier at the start of the late glacial interstadial. And within the first few centuries of the Mesolithic, we have evidence for human activity at multiple locations, both around the lake shore and on the two islands within the lake itself. Uh, and this activity takes place in a landscape where, where areas of forests are starting to develop because we're, we're just a few centuries after the end of the last ice age. So, so large areas of the landscape are open, but we're starting to get forest development. Um, we have these large sort of open areas around them. And then within the, the lake itself, we have a really rich and varied wetland that's forming within the shallower parts of the lake margin. But for this study, uh, I'm not going to look at any of these interesting plants. I'm going to be looking at a different type of plant. I'm going to be focusing on, on weeds or more correctly, what we refer to as ruderal taxa. Now, in Paleoecological terms um, and in, in archaeological studies, we generally use as uh, sort of ruderal plants or weeds uh, as indicators of human action because they're very good at colonising disturbed areas of ground. Uh, but what I want to do is to rethink this a little and to see them more as plants that through their movement become entangled with the lives of humans. And I'm going to start my journey with weeds at Star Car. <laughs> 
Uh, so this is a site that lies on the, the western side of the lake. Um, as with the rest of the landscape, there were areas of woodland cover uh, would have been forming around the site. There were willow, birch and aspen trees growing at the water's edge and beds of reeds and sedges expanding out from the shore and into the sort of the shallower parts of the lake at the site. And there were also an awful lot of weeds and they also have really great names. So we've got uh, mug, species of mugwort, we've got dock, and sorrel, nettles, we've got several species pieces of goose foot, so I don't know if that should be goose feet. Uh, we've got hemp nettle, we've got chicken weed, which is ironic because don't have chickens in the Mesolithic. We've got rose bay, willow herb, plantains, knot grasses, just to name a few of them. So we've got a load of different weed species that we know are growing at Starkar itself very early on in the, in the history of the site. Now, our environmental records don't predate human occupation at Starkar, so we can't see how abundant these plants were prior to the arrival of humans, which is unfortunate. But some of these species do show a clear increase through the period of time that humans are present at Starkar. And crucially, they also increase as the intensity of human activity at Starkar also increases. So whilst these species might have been at the site before humans, they clearly become more abundant after humans arrive and they're becoming especially abundant when there's more evidence for human activity. So why is this? Why are weeds wandering onto our site at Starkar? Well, Almost as soon as humans arrive at Starkar, they start changing the conditions of the site in a way that unintentionally makes space for weeds to move into. They're digging post holes for structures, which disturbs the soils. They're lighting fires on the ground that are burning the plants around them. They're walking across sites and trampling existing plants. They're butchering animals. They're processing hides and leaving animal waste on the ground. And all that will be changing the nutrient status of the soils. They're working wood and leaving large amounts of wood debris on the ground. It's also changing the nature of, the, of the, the environments in those areas. And crucially, they also create a, a massive midden of animal remains and other materials, which again is being burnt and which again would change the, the soil conditions as the nutrient status of the soils where the midden was. And, and weed species respond to these actions by moving onto the site and colonising the site. There'd be nettles growing across the midden and around areas where waste was being deposited. There'd be plantains, sorrels and docks around the edges of paths and around houses. Everywhere that human action was altering the original conditions, weeds would flourish. And very quickly, this would create a very particular floral community within and around the site that would be very, very distinct from the surrounding landscape. Now, this isn't just happening at Star Car. We have a, a number of other sites around the lake, which we know from our radiocarbon chronologies were occupied at pretty much the same time. And where we see similar forms of activity that again are disturbing existing plant communities and disturbing and changing the soil. So for example, we have the evidence, evidence for the digging of small pits and post holes at these sites. We have the butchering of animal remains, processing of hides, setting of fires, accidental burnings of, of wetland vegetation, disturbance of woodland and so forth. And again, these actions are, are making spaces for particular species of plants. So, for example, if we look at the pollen records for the site of Flixton School Field, which is on the southern shore of the lake, it's about a, a kilometre or so away from Star Car, but is contemporary with the occupation there. At Flixton School Field, human activity coincides with increases in nettles, sorrels and plantains, according to the pollen record. So the same communities are growing at Star Car. And so again, we're seeing very particular floral communities forming within areas of the landscape where humans are active. So so uh, interactions between humans and plants create these really distinctive environments within the landscape and these occur without any intentionality on the part of humans. They're emerging through multi-species relationships. It's, it's the unintended consequences of human actions that is, is structuring and maintaining and creating these environments along with the responses of plants and also probably uh, animals. Um, and personally, I know weeds aren't, aren't everybody's thing, but I think this gives us a really different way of thinking about environments in the past uh, and indeed thinking about our own environments today. Rather than seeing a, a dichotomy between environments that are natural and those that are managed, we can see them for what they really are, as messy, disturbed, busy spaces that arise and change through relationships between humans and non-humans, and which then are maintained, structured, and then changed through time 
as these relationships all change. Um, I'd also argue that if you take away that sort of intentionality, that we, 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 we stop thinking about intentionality as being the only driving force in the way in which environments are, are, are created and changed, we can also reflect a little on how humans may have perceived this movement of weeds, because I don't think it's going too far to suggest that humans would have noticed this. These plants move into new areas very quickly. Anyone that's got a, uh, you know, today who's got a garden or any bit of ground that isn't solid concrete, be well aware of just how quickly quickly weeds will grow, how quickly a range of different species will become established. So at a site level, it's unlikely that Mesolithic humans wouldn't be aware of the movement of these plants. And the same is true at a landscape level. Moving around Lake Flixton, you'd see the same species becoming established at all of the places where humans were active. And this might have given a sense that plants accompany humans, with humans and plants moving together within the landscape. Weeds as a companion species of sorts. Um, we can certainly argue that these plants would have had an effect on the nature of these places. Their colours and smells and their textures would create uh, a really distinctive feel about these locations. Yeah, anyone that's seen a uh, rose bay willow herb, for example, growing together uh, you know, in the summer, you recognise that, that massive burst of colour that you get along the edges of roads or paths. You get a similar thing with, with sorrels later in the year, where concentrations of sorrel will create patches of a, a rusty, reddy brown around the edges of fields. So these plants would have an effect on humans in terms of uh, sensory engagements. Um, more uh, speculatively, um, many of these plants may have been economically important. Um, while we don't have evidence for their use at these particular sites, we know that uh, nettle was used for making cord at other Mesolithic sites in Northern Europe. So, so nettle was certainly uh, an economic plant in other regions of the Mesolithic. Um, and if we look at the uh, ethno ethnobotanical and ethnohistorical record, many of the species that are turning up at sites like Starkar are known to have been used as foods and medicines until relatively recently by communities across the world, including our own. We have a rich history of using uh, species that we now refer to as weeds, as foods, as medicines and as other economic plants right the way up into the early part of the 20th century. And I think we just need to think, um, how would Mesolithic people have, have thought about the fact that economically important plants would practically accompany, accompany them as they moved across the landscape, appearing on sites without any form of intentional management and moving along with humans as they move to different parts of the landscape? Well, people did seem to recognise the agency and potentially potentially the animacy of some plants. We see this particularly in trees. Um, we know that uh, the disposal of artefacts made from wood was carried out in a very prescribed way at Starkar and at least one other site around the lake where people are removing the wooden components from tools and treating them very differently from the parts of the tools made from animal remains. Uh, we have one case of what looks like an offering placed at the base of a tree at Star car. It's this, uh, see on the slide here, a, a concentration of um, flint nodules, un largely unworked flint nodules that have been placed together, uh, possibly wrapped in something, can't really tell, but placed together amongst the roots of a tree. Uh, and axes, a, a tool associated with, wood with woodworking, gets treated very differently to other stone tools at Star car and other sites in this landscape. Um, and I've argued previously that this reflects uh, the prescribed forms of treatment of, of uh, plant of, of the materials from trees and objects made for working trees that reflects uh, an acknowledgement of the trees uh, animacy it's it's intention it's it's intentional sort of behavior and action in response to humans and so i would argue that again we probably see this with other plants so this accompanying accompaniment if you like of, of plants following people around and occurring on sites where humans were the same sorts of species that potentially were quite economically important might also have been seen as an intentional act on the part of plants themselves so i think i'll just leave that with that massively speculatively point and uh, say thank you very much for indulging the sort of planty wanderings <laughs>